Well, welcome as uh, summer is beginning to come to a close. Slowly, nearly everyone's getting back here from summer, and it's good to have everyone back if you've been traveling some this summer, and we're going to dive into the Word in a second, but just want to mention a couple things first, and then I'll pray. Um, if you are visiting with us, we'd love to know that. We would love uh, if you would take a moment and just fill out a connection card. And uh, those are available in the back, or you can up here on the screen. We also, if you know how to use that little guy, I forget what it's called, QR code, <laughs> you can do that, and you can fill it out online real quick. Let us know if you're visiting with us, or if you're more old school like me, uh, there's some copies in the back over, over by the uh, serving wall sign over there as well. And we'd love to know that you're visiting with us, and we have a gift we want to give you as well. So if you uh, go back to the... Uh, a welcome table in the foyer. We have a gift we'd like to give to you if you're visiting with us, just to let you know how happy we are that you uh, chose to join us today. Uh, over the course of this month, and we'll try to do it in doses here because we don't want to overwhelm everybody, um, but we want to, over the course of this month, let you know what the fall looks like here at Church uh, on the Rock. And so different opportunities to, to get into a group, and to serve somewhere, and then just some incredible events, church-wide events that we have planned this fall. And so we're going to give you a little bit at a time. Um, you saw, if you were here on time, if you were here at, right at 10, you saw a video that shows 33 series. We're going to have sign-ups for that for our guys uh, starting next week. But for our ladies, um, we're going to have a Bible study as well. You can sign up for that. But let me just mention a couple of the events that we have coming up. First, for our men, we are having a camping trip planned for September 13th and the 14th. This is for all ages, so bring your sons, and you can sign up at the Welcome Center or on our website. This is a great guy. Just, even if you can't spend the, both days, if you can even spend part of that time, guys, seriously, I want this to be the year. It's funny, we're two, year, two and a half years in, but I still get people saying, I still don't know people. And, uh, and we want that to change because you know what we are? We are not just a church building that people come to. We are a church family. And we have to get back to the biblical definition of what church is. And that's family. And I know with 300 plus people, you're not going to know every single person. I know that that's impossible. But to get connected with a group of people and build friendships and relationships for spiritual encouragement and accountability. And some of these opportunities that we're presenting is not just, you know, hey, why not? We're very intentional about connecting each other. And so this camping trip is a great way to get connected. And for our ladies as well, September 21st from 9 to 1, they have an incredible day celebrating God through creation, the word, and worship. And we want to encourage you to sign up for In Creation. It's a one-day event and uh, really want to encourage you. There is a, women, Jessica, are you guys going to be at the, call you out here in front of everyone, sorry. Are you going to be at the table after the service? Is there, okay, cool. So we're, the guys aren't awesome enough to have our own table, okay, but the ladies are, the ladies have their own table back there, and uh, you can find out more about that, about the Bible study that's coming up, but that was a great one-day event to connect and get to know some other ladies uh, in the church. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about the Rock Bible Institute, and I'll simply say, um, if you haven't signed up and you're planning on it, uh, now's the time, because there are some things that we need you to do ahead of time before it starts. Uh, so far, we have 44 individuals signed up to be part of uh, the Rock Bible Institute, and I say it every time just to make sure this is clear. What I talked about yeah, last week, disciple making, that's the whole point is to help equip and train and encourage us to truly be disciples who learn how to be disciple makers and learn how to serve others. And it's simply to give us the tools to better do that. So if you haven't already and you do want to sign up, I'm just simply saying like there's kind of no more waiting. Kind of you need to jump into that now. There's a uh, sign up in the back or you can do that online. 
There's a lot of other things that are happening, uh, but we'll continue to, to bring those up. Next week, we're going to focus on our, on our smaller group ministry, how to get into the various groups that we have uh, available for this coming fall. Um, one last thing, uh, Austin, who came up here and read some scripture and prayed, just so you know, you'll see his face from time to time. He's going to help out with, with some different areas of ministry uh, because we're doing with him a, a pastoral internship this year. Uh, he's studying for the ministry, and we want to give him some hands hands-on experience to get experience with that. And we're kind of using him because he's my son. We're using him as a guinea pig, kind of, <laughs> because this is something we envision in the future. We're serious about being dis dis disciple makers. And so not only of anyone here, but for those too that want to go into full-time ministry, we want to help in that journey. We want to give hands-on experience. So we're using Austin as our guinea pig this year and, you know, make all the mistakes this year on how to do a pastoral internship. So then, you know, by next year, if we have someone uh, that uh, is interested, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have it all figured out. So, and he can't get mad at me because he's my son, you know, so. So there we go. No, just kidding. We're excited for him to be able to help serve in some different ways. So, um, and also like if anything we do doesn't work um, and it just like, oh, that was really dumb. It was probably Austin's idea, the intern's idea. <laughs> just so you know, just, just kind of a, what you know. No, I'm kidding. All right. Hey, let's, let's pray. Are you ready to dive into the word? Yeah, let's go. That's horrible. Come on. You ready to dive into the word? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> what an awesome privilege it is this morning to, to sit at your feet and listen to the things that you want to say to us, Father. We are imperfect people, but your word is perfect. And the perfect spirit of God indwells each of us that know you. And therefore, because of that, there's great confidence to know that your word will not return void. So Father, may we open our hearts to the things that you want to say to us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, I was watching a movie this past week, just a couple days ago actually, and there was a poem, and it's not even a real poem, uh, it's a poem that was made up for the movie, and it's just four lines long, but I just loved it. Like, like do you ever just sometimes, like, you know, you hear something like, eh, but, you know, like a song, then, then one will just hit you, like, oh, it just, oh, it just resonates. It's kind of one of those things, and so I ended up memorizing it, because it's only four lines. Because I was like, this, this is like the awesomest poem ever. And then I, I like set it from memory to my in-laws and to my wife and to one of my younger kids. And none of them were impressed. <laughs> so for some reason, they didn't think it was a very awesome poem. But I got to thinking why it resonated so deeply within my soul. This, this poem, it was actually a made-up poem. And I realized because it really kind of flows with some of the things from today that we're going to be looking at and just some stirrings in my own heart that God over the last couple months have just been stirring me to, and I, I kind of shared it last week, I don't want to build a good church. I want to truly be disciple makers. That's the call. You know, and I want to fight for that. I want to climb the mountain. I want to, I want to give my last season to that. I got a pretty good track record of help, helping big, build good churches. I don't want that. That's not what I'm going to stand before God and give an account for. So did you make disciples <laughs> of all nations? So maybe that's why it resonated with me. But here's the poem. Once more, into the fray, into the last good fight I'll ever know. Live and die on this day. Live and die on this day. I don't even know what I got out of it is what the poem actually means because I'm not into poetry. But it resonated with me because I don't want to coast into glory. I don't want to give the last season of ministry just a comfortable, safe, Good church, I want to storm the gates of hell, even with a water pistol if necessary. Amen. Do you know what I'm saying? Or let me quote from a theologian, otherwise known as Rambo. <laughs> Live for nothing or die for something. Probably better put by Martin Luther King Jr., who said these words, a man who hasn't found something worth dying for is not fit to live. 
That's my challenge for today. As we look at this passage in Mark chapter 6, do you and do I have a faith worth dying for? Not just living for, but dying for. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Today, we've been looking at the life of Jesus as it relates to his disciples. Well, today, where we find ourselves in Mark is really looking at really the final days of the life of John the Baptist. And he certainly had a faith worth dying for. Pick it up in chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. It says, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Now, this is not the same King Herod. This is not Herod the Great, the one who tried to have all the, the, the baby boys killed in Bethlehem. This is actually his son. Once King Herod died, he split up the kingdom into four his four sons. One of them was Herod uh, Antipas. That's who we're talking about here. He's in charge of the Galilean area. Okay? Anyways, King Herod, Herod Antipas, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John, the, um, oh, by the way, what's it? It is the miracles that God, Jesus was doing that we've looked at over the last couple weeks. Some said that this Jesus was John the Baptist who had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, no, he is Elijah who has come back. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, we're, we're going to get to the story of how that happened. But before that, I, just, I think this is interesting here. There's this dispute on who is Jesus. And so the starting point, I'm going to give you four things if you want to take notes. It's also on our app as well. But I want to give you four things that if we're going to have a faith worth dying for, four things that we need to understand from this passage. Number one, having a faith worth dying for begins with belief in who it is we die for. I mean, I hope we wouldn't just die for anyone. <laughs> but we have to know who it is we're dying for. And, and there was much confusion going on in the days of Jesus on who he was. Herod didn't know who he was. The people didn't know. The religious leaders didn't even know who it was. They thought, well, my goodness, all of these incredible things that he's able to do, his teaching, his miracles... They didn't see him as the true son of God, part of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. No, they said, oh, it must be a reincarnation, a reappearance, uh, the ghost, uh, so to speak, of John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the other prophets. I see the most important question any of us will ask, not even us who, who are, would identify as Christian, but the most important question that anyone walking the earth, anyone that has breath, has to be able to answer is this. Who is Jesus? This is everything. We talked about disciple making yesterday, or last Sunday. At the end of the day, when we go through our neighborhoods, and we spend time with our family, and at work, what should be an obsession to us is do people know who Jesus is? Amen. In my opinion, we have very self-absorbed form of Christianity in the States today. My best life now. Following Jesus means all of this stuff for me. And all. Of, listen, we have been called not to get, but to give away. Amen. To give up. To deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. That may not sell as well in the Christian bookstore, but Christian music, but that's the call of a disciple. Come, die to self, and live for me. Every one of us who claim to know Christ, we need to start saying, that's the question that needs to be answered most. Not only in my life, who is Jesus in my life? But who is Jesus in the lives of those around me? C.S. Lewis famously put it in his book, Mere Christianity. I love how he identified Jesus. He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. 
I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Most religions will say favorable things about Jesus. But they don't answer the true question the right way of who Jesus is. That's what separates Christianity from all other religions. I have sat down, in my home, I have sat down with Jehovah Witness, with Mormons. They have very favorable things to say about Jesus. And I let them go on and on for a while. And then I ask the million dollar question, do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that through Jesus is the only path to salvation? And that those two questions is what separates Christianity from all other religions. It's not about being a fan of Jesus. It's not about being favorable to who Jesus is. A lot of religions are that. But a disciple of Jesus understands that he is God himself. That he is the only way. His death and resurrection is the only work that saves and that he is the only one worth laying down everything we have to follow. Amen. Who does Jesus say that Jesus is? John 8, 58, I'll tell you. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Play on words, by the way, I am. As one of the most holy and sacred uh, uh, phrases for God. The people, the religious leaders knew exactly what Jesus was doing there because it says they picked up stones to stone him and said that he's blaspheming God. Jesus was making it very clear. I am. Before Abraham, I was. I am. And then he said in John 10.30, I and the Father are one, three in one, the Holy Trinity, one person, uh, one God existing in three persons. Jesus himself articulates that. That's the starting point for you and I. If we're ever going to really have a faith worth dying for, that we're willing to pour out everything for, then we have to c come to terms who we really understand and believe Jesus to be. Let's keep reading. Verse 17 through 20. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe when he heard him. He was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. The second thing we need to understand if we're going to have a faith worth dying for is this. Having a faith worth dying for involves the willingness to stand for truth despite the cost involved. And we're going to see in a few minutes just what that cost him. John the Baptist stood before the most powerful person governing that area. I mean, he answered to the Roman Empire, but he, was, he, he governed that area. This, was, this guy could have taken his life, and as we see, will. But he was called to be a prophet. 
He was called to stand up and speak truth. And so he spoke truth. Herod took his brother's wife, adultery. We don't know. It doesn't tell us. I don't know if he divorced his wife or he just added her to the mix. I don't know. But he committed adultery. He took his brother's wife. Now, I think it's important that we're careful here. We speak a lot about speaking the truth in love. We have to be innocent as doves and wise as serpents in the world that we live in today. I don't think that we go around and condemning everyone's sin, especially they living outside of the body of Christ. They don't even know Christ. That's not the take home here. Okay? John had a very specific ministry to prepare the way for the Lord, and his specific ministry was to tell all people, not just the Jewish people, all people, to repent of sin and follow Jesus. But there is a timeless truth for us here that we have to be willing to step up and speak truth. We have to, to speak truth, but in love. We have to be wise in how we do it. In fact, even the Apostle Paul said that those, I don't judge those outside of the church. In other words, I, I, I would not judge a person who doesn't know Christ to start, you know, like they should act like Christ. A person not going to act like Christ until they know Christ. And we do this all the time, stuff we put on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever, how we interact sometimes. It, it's like we want to clean people up before they come to Christ. Listen, let me free you. Let me free you up. You don't have to clean any unbeliever up. You just bring them to the foot of the cross. Let God do the heavy lifting. Let the Holy Spirit do his work to convict of sin. We show the love of Christ. We demonstrate the love of Christ. We share the love of Christ. We're not afraid to speak truth in people's lives. But we're not the moral police of people who don't even know Jesus. And that's why I'm saying we have to be Innocent as doves and wise as serpents in how we interact with those far from God. So I just want to balance that out. Because I think we have a lot to learn as a church in our culture in this regard. But, having said that, whether with a believer or non-believer, there are those times where the glory of God, we are so consumed with the glory of God and his name and his honor that there are times that we need to stand up and proclaim and speak truth no matter what the cost may be. Do we have a faith worth dying for? A faith where we're willing to take that kind of stand, whatever that looks like in your context, even if it costs something, if it costs everything. Luke chapter 14, verse 27 through 33, Jesus said this, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. Let me just, this parable of Jesus, let me just say, I think what he's saying here is that we need to consider that cost. If we're going to follow after Jesus, we need to consider the cost because we say and we proclaim and yeah, I'm all in, and then we don't. We make a mockery, a laughing stock of the name of Christ. We need to consider the cost. He goes on and gives another parable. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciples. You see, this is the kind of stuff that Jesus said when large crowds were coming. He'd say stuff like this, and then it's just the 12 clueless disciples left. Do, 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 do. You're not going to go anywhere? Where else are we going to go? Nobody wants us. <laughs> you know, I make fun of the disciples kind of pre 
pre-Pentecost, <laughs> pre-Holy Spirit. You know, we got a lot of material to work with of disciples screwing up. I actually find that quite liberating, uh, quite encouraging to see them screw up. <laughs> I tell you what, the one thing they got right is they clung to Christ, even in their screwing up. They did consider the cost. And even in their screw-ups, <laughs> even after they deserted him at, at the cross, they still came back to him. I think all of us, is, is this just a comfortable form of Christianity that I have? Or, or if that day comes where it, it, it is life or death, or the loss of, of, a, of, of a, a meaningful relationship with me, am I truly considered the cost and am I willing to give up everything to follow after Christ? I think the third thing that we see in this story, number three, is having a faith worth dying for may not lead to popularity, but it will lead to respect. You see that? He wasn't really liked in Herod's <laughs> palace. But I'm going to tell you, Herod had a healthy respect. The idea of fear is that idea of kind of like a, a healthy fear of, like there's something about this guy, this quirky guy that eats bugs, you know, wear, wears a robe, hangs out in the wilderness, you know, the, you know, radically different than the world I've ever known. But there is something about him, there is something. And it didn't make him popular among the people because prophets don't tend to be that popular. And I just want to say something. I believe that God has called us to be prophetic in our world again, that we need to step up and speak truth again. We need to be like the prophets of old who are willing to stand up for truth and not be ashamed of saying what we believe about marriage, about gender, about anything that's contrary to God and his word. We have to be wise in how we do it, in the right spirit. And it may not make us popular, but when people know your true colors and they respect that, guess who some of them are going to turn to when they need prayer? Amen. When everything they've tried by the world standard hasn't worked and they remember you, Boy, I didn't agree with his politics or the stuff he was saying about the Bible. I, I, boy, he sure seems to have a peace and joy about him. He sure seems to have hope in his life or her life. Now, all of a sudden, you may not be the, the popular one at the office, but you're the one they run to oftentimes when their lives are in shambles and they don't have the answers. And somewhere down deep, they know that you do. Even though they've never been able to admit it up to that point. But now they do. Listen, we can choose the applause of man or the pleasure of God. That's what it comes down to, church. And I would rather be respected for what I believe in than accepted because I wasn't willing to stand up for what I believe in. I mean, that's the contrast we see throughout Scripture. We just finished a, a Bible study with, with men on Thursday mornings. In, in 1 John, this constant contrast of darkness and lightness, darkness and lightness. Matthew 5, Jesus says, being the salt of the earth. I don't know. My, like, some of you are like healthy and you eat popcorn without salt. That's sin. That's sin. You, you need to be confronted for this. Can you imagine popcorn with no salt? I mean, why go on living if you're going to eat popcorn without salt? Why well, salt? It gives it flavor. And butter, and butter of course. <laughs> <laughs> right? Salt of the earth. Stand out in contrast. This is the problem. 
We want to be accepted by the crowd instead of st standing out in contrast to what the world has to offer. They won't always make us pop it won't always make us popular to stand to our convictions, to be willing to speak these truths in love. But it will lead, grudgingly so maybe sometimes, but respect. And someone they can know they can turn to if they really have a question about eternity, about God, about the faith. Amen? Amen. I love this. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 through, uh, 1 through 3. Peter and John, this is about Peter and John. It says that as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. What they then tried to do, and I'm going to skip it for the sake of time, what they tried to do is they tried to get them to recant, and they refused to recant. They said, we're not, I'd rather die, we'd rather jail, we'd rather prison, we'd rather die, if that's what it means. We're not recanting. And then it says in verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were what? Astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's what I want for every one of you. That's what I want for me. I want them to look at this church and say, oh, you know what? I wasn't that impressed with the people when I got there. They didn't, they didn't you know, they were just kind of just normal people. Actually, a lot of them weren't normal. Especially the pastor. Why'd they hire that guy? But then they said, but I'll tell you what. Something's going on. Something's happening. I want to know more. <laughs> this church must always be only about the precious name of Jesus. I'm going to let you on a little secret. I'm leaving someday. Either I'm too old to do it, or you get sick of me and kick me out, I don't know, or I die. But the reality is, I'm not going to be the pastor at Church on the Rock 30 years from now. I might not be here a year from now. Nobody knows when they live or die. I have seen church after church after church. Though they wouldn't say it, but the foundation was the pastor. And when the pastor dies or the pastor leaves or the pastor falls, so goes the church. I have this conviction more than at any time in my entire ministry life. My job is not to be the star of this church. My job, according to e Ephesians 4, is to equip, along with the elders, equip God's people for works of service. Amen. To be a disciple maker, where everyone is equipped to be disciple makers. And then whatever goofball they get, <laughs> it won't matter because the people are doing what the people are called to do. Make disciples. Who we'll make disciples. Amen? Amen. Amen? God doesn't need... I mean, look at these guys. Uneducated, common men. But they've been with Jesus. We don't need great talent. What we need is people that have been with Jesus. That's what's going to have the greatest impact is that we are obsessed with the person of Jesus Christ. That's why that was my first question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to us? Let's finish it up. Verse 21 through 29. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests and the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. 
And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, in other words, he wanted to save face, and he had made an oath, which were binding back then. He did not want to break his word to her. <clears throat> and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Scripture is polite in its wording. The idea here is that her dancing pleasured the king and others. The idea is that he actually brought out his, what would be technically his stepdaughter, to sexually pleasure the guests with her dancing. That's how sick the culture was. That's how desperate they needed light in the darkness. And that's why John the Baptist was willing to die, to speak light into dark places. And it's so easy on the surface for us to look at this story and say, say that it ended horribly, that it ended unsuccessfully. And I would disagree with that. Because here's my fourth point, and I'll explain it. Having a faith worth dying for wins in the end. Amen. You got to catch that last word, end, in the end. We're still talking about John the Baptist, aren't we? You, you know, <clears throat> I, 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 I don't know the answer, but I wonder how many people around the world are speaking on John the Baptist today. Anybody speaking about Herod Antipas? Who is far more powerful? Any, any churches being inspired by his story? No. You see, the disciple of Christ must have eternal perspective when he views what's happening here and now. The story does not end in defeat. In fact, Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in, in, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you're facing some ridicule, even persecution, if you've lost some friendships all right, over your stance and commitment to Christ, okay, don't sulk, don't pout, stand up proudly and say, I am like the prophets of old. Amen. Be proud of wearing that badge of honor. The end of John the Baptist story is not the disciples taking his headless body to a tomb. Let me say it again. The end of John the Baptist story is not the disciples taking his headless body to a tomb. The end of the story is the glories of heaven for him. Well, he will be much rewarded. And guess what? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's true for you and it's true for me. Come on, church. That's enough to make a Baptist want to dance. Come on. <laughs> Have we become so enamored by this world that the death of a follower of Jesus is met with pity instead of praise? Have we forgotten where our home is? Heaven is the win. 
And here we are 2,000 years later being inspired. Not just by his life, but by his death. I have two pictures or posters, framed posters in my office. And I meant to bring them. So you're going to have to wait for a second because I need to go get them. I love I can do this. Oh, it's locked. That was going to be awesome. <laughs> well, I don't remember the whole saying of one of them, but it's by C.S. Lewis. One of them is by C.S. Lewis, which says along these lines that if there's nothing in this world that can totally, fully satisfy us, then it means we were created for something else. The reason I have that on my bookshelf, see it every day when I'm in the office, is because I forget that. Sometimes I forget that. I lose my eternal perspective when stuff happens. The second one is a big mammoth. <laughs> I just had it done, 24 by 36, over my desk. And it's my life verse from the age, age of 17. I was encouraged by my youth pastor to have a life verse that kind of directed my life that I believe what God was calling me to. And it's it's uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And I found a cool printout of it. So now it's on my desk. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race, the Lord Jesus, excuse me, finish the task the Lord Jesus has given to me. The task of of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Amen. Hey, son, thank you. <laughs> See, the in intern didn't even think about doing that. <laughs> right here. Look at that every day. Every day. This is not a verse it's for pastors. It's a verse for everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ. By the way, it's a different version than I memorized it in. If some of you are looking at that saying, that's not how you quoted it. I couldn't find the uh, old version that I memorized it in. Do you have a faith worth not just living for, but dying for? Are you willing to stand up no matter the cost? Because your life isn't about what you accumulate here on earth, but to test, testifying to the gospel of God's grace that you've experienced and that you want others to experience in their life.